And then some constructed firms also think that they're sustainable. For example, Skanska is a huge international enterprise. Um, I bring this example up because I want to raise awareness on a new animal rights campaign. So this slide doesn't really have to do something with my talk, but I still want to bring it up because I think the campaign needs more attention. Um, so this campaign, No New Animal Lab, um, wants to stop the University of Washington from building a new animal lab in Seattle. And the main contractor is from this uh, construction firm. And they really say that like, they have this like this famous function of sustainability, etc. Et so it's a typical case of greenwashing, but still they engage in the construction construction of a new firm. And there have been a uh, new animal lab. And there have been demos across the country and also in, at the headquarters in Sweden. And this coming Monday, so in some days it's an international call-in day, so it would be really great if you call uh, New York City Scottsdale headquarters and ask them to cut their contract with the University of Washington. There's also a Facebook event. Okay, now let's go back to the topic. Um, yeah, let's go back to sustainable development. The most popular definition of sustainable development is perhaps a uh, definition from the so-called Grundland Report from 1987, um, which was the result of a UN meeting. Sustainable development is, a site development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But with this UN report, the World Bank report in 1987, sustainable development has become equivalent to sustainable growth. How come? Because in this highly influential report, uh, the environmental crisis has been defined as a problem of underdevelopment and poverty. So only more uh, economic development and growth, as a means to poverty eradication, could solve the crisis. The theory behind is called ecological modernization theory, which was developed in the 1980s. Ecological modernization theory is the neoliberal answer to the radical environmentalist movement of the 1970s. It promotes the viable and even profitable combination of environmental conservation and economic profit. And this combination is made possible through voluntary regulation and new green technologies. Uh, ecological modernization theory says that you can solve the environmental crisis, which actually was triggered through industrialization, with management, technology, and economic growth, thus with even more industrialization. So the insight is that there hasn't been enough industrialization yet. Nature should be regarded as capital, and to ensure the sustainable use of resources, um, environment, environmental goods such as the air or water, they need to be pressed. So from the 1980s on, sustainable development policies often focus on so-called green growth or green economy, and I will use these terms subsequently as synonyms to green capitalism. After the climate summit in Copenhagen in 2009, this scene came out by activist scholars uh, that you see on the left side, dealing with distractions confronting uh, green capitalism in Copenhagen and beyond. And the title, Dealing with Distractions, refers um, to the distractions that the global elite use to divert our attention from underlying like, systems of oppression and power structures. What I want to say is that due to, to the environmental crisis, um, like the elite of government saying, well, we need new green policies to address this crisis, right? And it's real. It's, it's, it's a, there's a big sense of urgency. Um, but these new policies, include the modification of nature, sometimes racist, anti-immigration, and population control policies, and it also includes to blame the poor for their environmental destruction. So the, the poor are now scapegoats for the crisis. So all these politics are kind of painted in green, what distracts us from the underlying power structures. So the crisis is currently instrumentalized to justify a reactionary agenda. And now, throughout my presentation, I will always um, address some of these distractions and I will symbolize them with these uh, shiny green diamonds. Okay, so what is the result of almost five decades of sustainable development or rather green capitalism? Um, we have different signs of the crisis. I guess we all know of 
climate change, although we are in the US, but we still yeah, acknowledge that perhaps there is climate change. <laughs> um, but I would also bring forth the concept of planetary boundaries. Um, and this concept has been developed by a group of scientists uh, some years ago, led by this environmental scientist, Rockström. Um, and they identified and quantified a set of nine planetary boundaries within which humanity can uh, live for the generations to come. And climate change is one of them. And crossing these boundaries would mean irre irreversible environmental change. So next to climate change, we have ocean acidification, ozone depletion, nit nitrogen and phosphor cycle, freshwater use, changes in land use, biodiversity loss, uh, atmospheric aerosol, and chemical pollution. And as you see, yeah, three of these boundaries have been really crossed already. And yeah, we have to see what, what comes next. Um, and to grasp this new relationship with nature that we have now, um, which is a very disruptive one, scholars have brought forth the term of the Anthropocene, which means the age of men. So it, we are now in a new geological epoch where human beings are the biggest volcanic power and we really, really shape like a face of the earth. Here again, we also have to be cautious. Um, do we live in a global society where everybody has the same power? Seems like a distraction. From a political ecology perspective, um, one root cause of this new epoch of this, uh, environmental crisis, um, one root cause is resource exploitation for infinite economic growth. And this economic growth does not serve the primary needs of the Earth's inhabitants, be it human or non-human. It rather serves um, the accumulation of capital of a small and few elite. This is why some scholars have uh, kind of countered the term of the Anthropocene with the term of the Capitalocene. Um, one of them is Jason Moore, and he's also a sociologist here at Binghamton University, interestingly. So I think uh, we can legitimately say that the term Anthropocene is a successful distraction from underlying societal power issues and also differentiated responsibilities for the environmental crisis. If we now look at the animal industrial complex, we have again um, an example for a capitalist enterprise that exploits countless individuals and nature as well. First and foremost, well, this is not, I guess, nothing new for you, um, every year, 70 billion non-human land animals are killed and an incredible amount of uh, marine individuals as well, which it's not, not even possible to count them because it's always their lives are only counted in terms of catch. Um, but you can have like an estimate of them. Then the environmental destruction ranges from enormous greenhouse gas emissions over water pollution, biodiversity loss, etc., etc., etc. And if we look again at the planetary boundaries, um, several of them are really cro being crossed because of the animal industry. So the animal industry is really the one of the most devastating industries of uh, the planet. You see here with these green, uh, yellow circles, this is where the animal industry really has bears a huge responsibility. And as these negative environmental consequences mainly hit like, the global south, as scholars have also brought forth the term of environmental racism. And there are many more social consequences, of course. The animal industrial complex uses more than 35% of global grain harvest, while simultaneously 1 billion people are malnourished. Um, but here we, can, we have to be cautious as well, because already today we have enough food to feed the whole planet. So this means uh, hunger is not just a problem of production, but of dist uh, distribution, and which makes it again a political, power, a political issue. Further, the industry occupies 80% uh, of uh, the global arable land, which is a huge amount if you think about it. And I guess this process hasn't been a very peaceful or natural one, but it, it has involved and still involves um, the displacement and expropriation of many of the indigenous people and to convert their land into raising more crop fields. Also, like in the animal industry, the work, like working conditions are horrifying, it's precarious work, the work is very dangerous, and the workers have to suffer a 
highly, like a disproportionate amount of physical and psychological suffering. Slaughterhouses are organized along race and class lines, and there's also a lot of uh, gender dynamics to me, and we will have a panel on that tomorrow. What makes the whole story even more horrifying is that meat consumption is expected to double by 2015. And this increase is called the livestock revolution, hereby referring to the green revolution in agriculture in the 1960s. Well, if meat uh, production doubles by 2050, uh, all the horrors that I mentioned before, like the social and environmental impact of the animal industry will significantly significantly increase as well. And of course, the violence committed uh, to farmed animals will take place on an even more massive and inconceivable scale. Um, this livestock revolution is brought forth mainly by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the FAO. Further, it is also actively promoted by the animal industry, what a surprise, uh, by lobbies and by governments. And these actors, are, a lot of them, are united in an international coalition, which is called the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. And to succeed with their revolution, uh, the Global Agenda has, and to, su to succeed with the revolution, which also means that they have to comply with kind of tricky environmental limitations and with the crisis that I've mentioned above, the Global Agenda has created a simple but very sophisticated formula the li I cite, the livestock sector must produce more from less with benefits to all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, this seems to be magic. Uh, what is meant here by? Of course, it doesn't mean um, less animals. I mean, it will mean more animals. But it means less resources used and less waste and greenhouse gas emissions. This very sophisticated project is um, summed up under the keyword of sustainable intensification. Concretely, this means larger plants with more animals or less space, which is a classic in, in intensification. But to be green and sustainable, uh, with improved waste management, with improved animals, such as genetically modified animals with a like, changed digestion to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and with an improved diet, so-called environmental nutrition. Environmental nutrition is nutrition that provides the animal with a ma minimum amount of nutrients, but with a maximum amount of growth. This means that, for example, a pig is uh, getting very heavy in a too short amount of time, that, and she's not getting enough nutrients, so that in the end, um, her skeleton breaks while she's still alive. The scholar Jonathan Clark has framed this as environmental violence inflicted upon yeah, farm animals in an article published in the Journal for Critical Animal Studies. Okay. From the analytical standpoint of political ecology, um, we can assign the livestock revolution and sustainable intensification to ecological modernization theory. Why? I mean, the word sustainable intensification literally unites the principles of environmental protection on the one hand and economic growth on the other hand. Environmental problems are regulated here with new green technologies and management. And finally, green infinite growth is promoted uh, for the animal industry. However, this proposition is also criticized. I hereby draw uh, on the work of the sociologist Richard Twine, who's also part of ICAS, and the geo Tony Weiss. So the FAO presents the next revolution as something inevitable, as something necessary, as something natural, and even desirable. Yet for Weiss, um, this process is everything but natural. It is a deliberate and theoretical change. In the name of green growth, green production, and poverty eradication, lobbies are pushing for the next revolution. <laughs> the alleged need for new technology and new efficient facilities promises markets in so-called developing countries, some of them being uh, India, traditionally vegetarian countries. So here we have, again, another distraction. By portraying the livestock indus uh, industry and the livestock revolution as something inevitable and natural, the attention is distracted from the underlying process, which is a process of culture and economic imperialism. Attention is, of course, also distracted uh, from animal exploitation, 
because it is portrayed as something natural and necessary to feed the poor. Even more, it is sustainable, and so it's totally okay. Yeah. This leads us to another trend in uh, the animal industry, um, happy or sustainable or humane, ethical meat. Um, examples are grass-fed or organic and local mm -hmm. animal products. Uh, Vasilia Sadescu that has written some excellent pieces um, on sustainable meat and the local world movement. So this purported sustainability here is just used as a marketing strategy to divert attention from the persisting ethical issues um, of killing uh, sentient beings. Uh, here, animal exploitation is just plainly greenwashed, so it's again a distraction. And as I said, as I said before, McDonald's is, will be selling sustainable meat, Whole Foods, Chipotle, etc., etc. They all buy into this very um, promising new market. Actually, I think this is kind of funny. The brand Sustainable Meat um, never provides a concrete positive assessment of their environmental benefit. On the contrary, topic analysis suggests that from a purely ecological standpoint, industrial agriculture is actually like, more efficient, dealing with resources and it emits less greenhouse gases than so-called sustainable farming. Yeah, this brings us back again to the topic of distractions. Happy meat has actually nothing to do with sustainability or environmental benefit. It rather produces warm, fuzzy feelings about being in harmony with nature by buying pieces of dead animals. And also, as Vasile has described, the percentage of non-human animals killed uh, for this uh, new sustainable market is minimal, like really like perhaps one percent, even less. But still, the discourse on sustainable meat is really hegemonic and very popular. So ultimately, and most fundamentally, um, this powerful green rhetoric just serves as a legitimization of um, continued animal exploitation. The last part I want to um, touch upon is in vitro meat. In vitro meat is a quite recent uh, phenomenon. Um, we have here an explanatory scheme. First, we need a biopsy from a living animal. Uh, the cells are then reproduced and break in a lab, and then ultimately transformed in a piece of meat. And this meat should look and taste exactly like normal flesh from a butcher animal. Obviously, this has the advantage that no animal has to die for it, and it all, in vitro meat also has a much smaller environmental impact. And from a purely ecological perspective, the applied technology and the necessary infrastructure, they are very resource intensive, but this is no, no comparison with uh, the resources wasted for the animal industry. On the other hand, uh, in vitro meat is um, more resource, in resource intensive than already existing plant-based alternatives. So in vitro meat is still being developed and we don't know if it can ever be sold at a more or less reasonable price. And if we have a closer look to the production and politics of in vitro meat, I guess we see again that it distract, distracts us from the other very pressing issues of social justice and that integration. In vitro meat, on the one hand, it describes itself in the ecological modernization mindset, pretending to solve huge environmental problems with a new product, with a new market, with a new resource intensive technology. In vitro meat, at least projects that exist now, for example, with Morden Meadow in the US, uh, outspokenly caters to the societal elite. Uh, these companies, they want to create high-end uh, products for the rich. It is thus not an emancipatory, not a community-based project um, that should uh, meet primary needs. On the contrary, millions of dollars are invested to produce like um, one hamburger while millions of people are starving. It thus focuses on the hunger for me, on a very small uh, green high-tech elite and it ignores the ongoing starvation of the rest of the world. And when it comes to non-human animals, it perpetuates, at least in my view, like the idea um, that it's normal to eat non-human flesh, and it also distract, distracts attention from uh, already existing cheap, organic, plant-based alternatives. So after having discussed various like, green trends in the animal industry, 
I want to discuss um, the topic of green vegan consumerism. Um, what immediately, yeah, is this new emerging lifestyle veganism, which is characterized by the explosion of the cookbooks, restaurants, products, etc. So it's a very promising new market. And even some meat companies are now producing vegan alternatives. So it's kind of clear that corporations have uh, successfully co-opted um, a for formerly very radical idea of animal liberation, which was often, or which is often based in anarchism or anti-capitalism. And these re ideas have been reduced to mere brands. And to be clear, this is totally not to discredit veganism because um, just because an, a radical idea is being marketed, this doesn't mean that the idea is wrong. You can go to a shop and buy a shirt, like a design shirt with an anarchy symbol, but this doesn't mean that it's the fault of anarchism or that anarchism is wrong, a bad idea. My point is rather um, that we can again witness a series of distractions. And yeah, for example, why is everybody so excited when a new vegan product uh, is on the market? Why does, why, do, why does fancy vegan food get much more attention? than like a demo or successful direct action? And how can we be so hyped as a movement about new commodities when actually the movement should be a movement against the commodification of non-human animals and nature in general? So the fo this focus on consumerism or consumer politics is for me a sign of uh, depoliticization and the de-radicalization of the animal rights movement. Animal rights people are becoming happy, peaceful consumers, keep calm and go vegan, instead of being a thorn in the side of uh, the business sector and the state. It perhaps also shows how the animal liberation movement is kind of isolated within a broader uh, network of radical emancipatory groups. I guess one uh, reason for that is that a lot of animal rights people have a very privileged social status, including myself, um, being white, being middle class, able-bodied, etc. And in the US, this is also predominant, uh, animal rights people are predominantly also uh, Euro settlers. And that the movement, therefore, is kind of blind to societal hierarchies. And it can also be quite self-righteous and arrogant to non-vegan activists. Another, right, another reason, especially in the US, might be um, the ways of waves of repression that hit the movement, which really, I guess, had a chilling effect. Currently, the movement also goes through a stage of pro professionalization and corporate assimilation, and also a strange form kind of a leadership celebration, as I perceive, for example, in the current direct action everywhere movement. <laughs> yeah, here I would like to quote uh, Justin Kay. He published last summer uh, an article in the scene Resistance Ecology. So I cite him. We have to move beyond the distractions that prevent us as a movement from creating real change and mobilizing meaningful opposition to the structures that keep animal exploitation productive and lucrative, which means capitalism, colonialism, industrialization, urbanization, patriarchy, globalization. Every time that we don't oppose manifestations of these forms of power as a movement, we lose one for the animals. I think it's a really nice quote. And to prevent distraction and to focus on, on all of these different forms of oppression, the scholar Claire Kim uh, also proposes like, this concept of a multi-optic vision instead of a single optic vision. This means being aware of uh, intersections of oppression. I'm coming to an end. Yeah, I hope that I was able to present the issue of animal exploitation in neoliberal green capitalism in a productive way um, with the lens of political ecology, which means with a focus on power issues in our relationship uh, with nature, which also means uh, to be attentive uh, to all these green distractions from systems of oppression. Um, yeah, I guess it is very important that we engage in a collective conversation on how to move forward while also looking back. This is my last slide. Ashley, educate, organize. I'm sorry for this white heteronormative picture, but I don't um, So we should educate ourselves, reflect our own positions as well. We should know our enemies 
and though we've let some like right brain distractions blind us, we should focus on core issues on total liberation with this multi-optic view and finally organize within the animal liberation movement but also be in solidarity and engage with other radical groups that fight for environmental and social justice. Yeah, thank you very much for it. If you guys want to save your questions to the end, we'll have a big discussion on that. Right? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you want the light or not? Mm -hmm. No? I think she's waiting. Do you want lights on or off? Oh, um, I'm just going to read. So, so, so yes. Um, Okay, so uh, Laura Ofsted is a second year master's candidate in literature at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, specializing in literature and environment and critical animal studies. She's a teaching assistant at the university and assistant editor for the journal Isle, Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and Environment. Thank you. Um, I'm going to the necessity of ecological restoration to look towards rewilding humans as a crucial solution for many of the obstacles to its success, uh, including the health of our planet and species. Uh, I've broken, this will be in four parts. Uh, first, I'll explain the development of ecological restoration into the re rewilding um, movement. Um, second, I'll explain the concept of human rewilding into non practice and advocating within branch political groups. Um, and argue that it's a necessary but largely undiscussed step for ecological restoration. Third, I would like to, where other restorative ideologies could be synthesized with the human rewilding movement. And uh, fourth and finally, I will offer examples as to what human rewilding could look like today. So first, an overview of ecological restoration. Um, ecological restoration is uh, founded on the idea that ecosystems do not exist in isolation but in a constant process of exchange with everything around them. In the late 20th century, scientists realized that not only were tracks of reserve land becoming degraded, uh, but that action needed to be taken to bring them back to health. Ecological restoration is defined as initiating or accelerating the recovery of an ecosystem with respect to its health, integrity, and sustainability, so that it can continue to evolve and change as it would have without the human disturbance that necessitated restoration. So obviously, uh, many of the core debates of ecological restoration revolve around elements of human choice and control uh, in shaping the environment. These components are present as, at a basic level, such as choosing which ecosystem to restore, um, but also in looking at what species or elements are focused on in the restoration project and um, what the end goal of the project is going to be. Choice and control are additionally present in conversations regarding treatment of non-native or invasive species, um, assisted migration of species to aid them in survival global warming, uh, et cetera. Uh, despite acknowledging issues of human choice and control, most skeptics of ecological, ecological restoration, most, actually, most restorationists themselves fail to penetrate the issue of what to do with the human itself, who biologically the undertaking of restoration is based on is inseparable from the not the human out living in the woods, but all humans living in all places. Humans who, according to biologist Stuart K. Allison, have domesticated more than half the Earth's total land surface and degraded two thirds of the Earth's ecosystems. So, out of this rampant domestication and degradation comes the concept of rewilding. Um, rewilding is a term originally attributed to Dave Foreman, who, as many of you know, was the founder of Earth first. The welding was expanded into a radical conservation and restoration strategy with the work of conservation biologists Michael Sule and Reed Noss. In their 1998 article, Rewilding and Biodiversity, they define rewilding as, quote, the scientific argument for restoring big wilderness based on the regulatory rules of large predators, unquote. Uh, ultimately, Sule and Noss propose a plan for rewilding that incorporates three independent principles. 
four reserves of land that are uh, mostly or largely undisturbed by humans, uh, connectivity between these core reserves, and the existence of large carnivores. So the science behind rewilding. Uh, so this concept is founded on the juncture of various recent developments in biological study, including island biogeography, which has shown that species are highly vulnerable to extinction on small, isolated tracts of land, whether those are islands or park systems. And the discovery that large carnivores require a wide-ranging habitat, which, if provided to them, also offers a wide umbrella of land protection under which many species can find safety and resources. As such, large carnivores are often referred to as umbrella species. Essentially, the health and existence of large predators is a fairly accurate measurement of the health of the entire ecosystem, because they would not be able to exist if every trophic layer supporting them weren't already stable or at least present. Um, this is additionally true because top predators often function as keystone species whose absence generally leads to severe ecosystem degradation. Uh, so Leah Noss note that dramatic changes from loss of large carnivores will many times lead to biodiversity and species loss. This loss of biodiversity is also correlated with loss of ecosystem function. There are instances in which even the major prey species of a large carnivore is damaged by the loss of that carnivore, indicating more complex ecosystem processes than we generally attribute to our environment. So since the 1990s, rewilding as a conservation restoration strategy has expanded across the globe, but currently I'm interested in a new turn that rewilding can take into human rewilding. So, second part of human rewilding. If we recall uh, Foreman's background in radical environmental activism, we can look for use of the term rewilding in radical environmental circles. Um, one goes with Pernivus and our Pernivus and the anti-civilization perspectives, rewilding has long stood for human rewilding. Uh, an interest in rewilding the human has spread throughout contemporary Western culture in the form of furtive skills schools, um, intentional communities, and even following ancestral diets like the paleo, popular paleo diet. Um, so George Lombio, popular Canadian journalist, is the only non-anarchic artist I've seen addressing the issue of human rewilding. Uh, which he does in his book, Feral, Rewilding the Land, the Sea, and Human Life, which was published last year. Uh, Mambio's argument is practical. He does not imagine human rewilding as returning to any sort of golden age of human, non-human harmony. He does not imagine that it will be possible or desirable to give up all advanced technology. Um, and he does not imagine that the world is capable of supporting the entire human population as much these are all good and rational points to keep in mind. However, Mondio veers from the reasoning found in other sources of rewilding efforts, those which attempt to contextualize human needs um, within the needs of other species, and instead argues that rewilding can and should be done purely for human benefit. Um, he claims we suffer from ecological boredom, wrought by domestication and destruction of anything potentially hazardous and with benefits psychologically, spiritually from returning to a biologically diverse environment. I read his human-centered motivation partly as cynicism, partly as an appeal to readers who will never conceive the importance of their interests as second to something greater. But although this kind of human selfishness might lead to a similar physical end, the cultural values inherent in it are hierarchical and speciesist, contradicting the values that have been successful in other movements and cultures that have worked towards refiguring the human as an egalitarian member of the ecological community. Ultimately, I believe such selfish intentions will only backfire in the long run. So, uh, so the definition of royalty I find more holistic and compelling, I take from the Green Anarchy Collective. Um, according to this definition, rewilding has two major components. The first is physical and involves reclaiming skills and developing methods for a sustainable coexistence, including how to feed, shelter, and heal ourselves with the plants, animals, and materials occurring naturally in our bioregion. In, in the context of ecological restoration, this translates into a proposal to restore the human. Um, restore the human to their natural state as a keystone species, just as rewilding is proposed to restore uh, other large animals. Yet unlike top carnivores, humans would need to relearn how to interact in direct and healthy ways with their ecosystems as that knowledge has for the most part been lost. 
The majority of humans current manner of living is supported by distant ecosystems because the ones we live in are too degraded or undesirable to support us fully. This entails uh, excessive exploitation and production, as we've heard about. Um, we rely really large on remote corporate agriculture and mineral extraction, which plants, animals, and other elements are extensively manipulated. Um, humans included, while the majority of ecosystems are degraded, only a select number of humans live economically privileged and physically sheltered from this harsh and ugly reality. All, all of these behaviors affect the ecosystems. However, only when humans take responsibility for survival on a personal and local scale is an ecosystem interacted with on a level predictable and sustainable for a large mammal, and when its resources will be consumed in a way that comprehends the risks implicated in use and scarcity. Altering human participation in the ecosystem function in this way would not only increase the health of many of our ecosystems because of humans' evolutionary position as a large omnivorous mammal, but changing the way we interact also appears necessary because human presence has eliminated many of the other top carnivores and megafauna preceded us. It is further necessary to alter our ecosystem interaction simply because of the vastness of our population, both in our number and the extent of our habitat. For these reasons, it is far more important now than ever before for humans to play an active and reciprocal role in our ecosystems. So the second part of the Green Act Collective's definition uh, in contrast to the physical is emotional. It involves healing ourselves and each other from a 10,000 year old wounds which went deep, learning how to live together in non hierarchical and non oppressive communities, and deconstructing the domesticating mindset and our social patterns. Thus, a big part of human rewilding or human restoration is simply seeing the importance of relationships between humans and all species. Learning to live in community, a tribe, is key to human survival. It always has been. It has been crucial to our survival as well to understand and appreciate the delicate balance between our species others, because ultimately, we do not survive by our labor alone. Our lives depend on the lives of others. In order to recreate this communal understanding, however, we need to erase the myth of the independent, self sustaining individual, the myth created by capitalism and development, which shields us from all the people and other species that we truly rely on for our survival. So part three, intersecting approaches. Um, So this proposal of human rewilding is not altogether similar from bioregionalism, which encourages humans to make sustainable, non-exploitative life within the boundaries of a bioregion. Additionally, the component of healing, breaking down social hierarchies and oppression relating to the community, is strikingly similar to descriptions of cultural restoration, also called cultural revitalization and re-indigenization. I argue that these three conversations need to be synthesized as they originate in very different communities and can contribute to one another in important ways. So Gary Snyder in The Rediscovery of Turtle Island, an essay espousing by regionalism, writes that, quote, to restore the land one must live and work in a place. To restore, to work in a place is to work with others. People who work together in a place become a community, and a community in time grows a culture. To work on behalf of the wild is to restore a culture. Melissa K. Nelson, scholar and environmental activist at the Turtle Mountain Chippewa, states in her essay, Mending the Split Head Society with Trickster Consciousness, that, quote, if we are going to reharmonize nature and culture in a modern context, then we need to talk about how all of us are going to heal and learn from the destructive legacy of colonization. She proposes crafting a trickster consciousness through practicing traditional and cultural arts, crafts, language, and thought. And she says, when we recover indigenous languages and affirm cultural arts, we restore the native landscapes, habitats, and ecological relations that support those voices and creative expressions. These cultural revitalizations aid us in decolonizing our minds. Nature and culture are intimately entwined, not only for native peoples, but for all peoples. Surprisingly, these speakers, the motion towards a similar goal, have not been writing in dialogue with one another. There is much that can yet be done to unify these voices in order to strengthen this movement towards a physically and psychologically healthier human and interspecies existence. By regionalism, it's useful discussion by establishing the importance of living within the limits of a bioregion and the necessary aspects of truly living in place. Cultural restoration has the ability to provide visions of healthy, reciprocal, human non human relationships in which humans are in nature and yet are not exploitative. 
and also to demonstrate ways in which culture and spiritual practices can benefit the health of the ecosystem. Ecological restoration and relevant politics can join these perspectives to create an argument that is stronger in science, philosophy, and cultural relevance. So, uh, like, so the claim to real humans is admittedly a big one and even an unlikely one, so long as resource depletion is continually prolonged. Giving up the trappings of contemporary civilization is commonly viewed as unpleasant and undesirable, and certainly beyond most humans' experience. Um, thus, the majority of our species appear unwilling to give up these things unless forced to by not impending but actual disaster. Despite these obstacles, human rewilding has also both a practical and necessary response to the planetary degradation of techno industrial civilization, as well as the trauma most humans experience within its grasp. But how can we approach human rewilding? It's a large question with an extensive response, so I'll briefly gesture towards two general methods, one rural and one urban. Um, so when most people think of sustainable land-based living, they tend to think of rural areas. It's easy to imagine increased local reliance for things like shelter building, energy, water, food, and medicine or rural environments. Living in an insulated home, relying on wiki in the winter, shade in the summer, Edible foods, uh, keeping in mind risks for diseases and toxins that are specific to individual areas and species, and learning how to reserve food without additives or electricity, digging a well, developing a gray water system, uh, perhaps even developing a community in order to have a built in support network. Uh, ultimately, the goals for human rewilding are one, to decrease dependence on industrial agriculture, chemicals, and resources. Right on. And two, to develop ethical and reciprocal relationships with other humans and species so that human presence in any landscape can become less toxic and <coughs> In spite of all the things that human rewilding in a rural area might look like, it's important to note that it would be impossible for most humans to live entirely outside of civilization. Not in the view of economic dependence, uh, but because the knowledge and practices for many indigenous cultures have been lost. As such, transitioning into local reliance will be limited, even when, where it is economically viable, and the use of contemporary technology will probably need to be relied upon to some extent. Um, so, looking at urban areas, um, rewilding entirely is impossible in many areas, even if humans possess requisite skill and knowledge that um, ecosystem degradation population size will often not permit it, and many people don't want to or are unable to live outside of urban areas. So in these instances, the exact form of rewilding would shift. Um, but being able to live sustainably and in harmony with others is the main goal, thus in an urban area, this would still involve reliance on local resources and human cooperation, but might look a little bit different otherwise. And my favorite example of this is from Margaret Atwood's novel, The Year of the Flood, um, where she depicts a lifestyle of an urban community called the Goddess Gardeners who are religiously dedicated to living in balance with nature. They live in abandoned buildings, maintain rooftop gardens, uh, sift through trash for all of their material needs. One character is described as having a quilt so out of blue jeans and use bath mats, and uh, has curtains in place of apartment walls that are woven of plastic bag strips and duct tape. Children are raised communally, take classes on subjects like fabric recycling and sewing, Bees and mycology, wild garden botanicals. Um, Atwood, of course, is uh, writing a satirical novel, so she exaggerates the practices of this group. Uh, and there are conflicts among them regarding hierarchy and maltreatment. Uh, but these are realistic among a small, close knit community and fictionally dealt with in ways that reflect members' commitment to the community and its ongoing well being. In other words, with compassion and the knowledge that they all depend on one another. So, to conclude, as explained by Miles Olson in his book, Unlearn Rewild, rewilding is not a term commonly applied to humans. The process of returning a species or ecosystem to a natural, untamed state isn't exactly the direction much the community is heading in. Ultimately, I would like to know why not. In our path of population, explosion, and environmental destruction, we can no longer pretend that the, that the traditional mode of ecological restoration that of turning our attention to manage everything around us while refusing to confront ourselves is a viable solution. We can no longer pretend that our form of civilization is physically or spiritually fulfilling, and we are so far from living life in true wildness that there is no simple way of going back of your learning and lost cultural knowledge. Our cultural
culture needs to be rebuilt, and we need to look to the right places to know how to do it, to create some systems-based and harmonious interspecies lifestyles, building on traditional ecological knowledge of local indigenous peoples whenever possible. Restoration is often regarded as a hopeful enterprise of the rebirth or renewal of the land. But is it hopeful if we are not willing to restore ourselves? Okay, so uh, next up we have Dr. Anthony Lochella, um, and many of you guys know the uh, director and founder of this organization. So um, I'm going to be talking about race and, uh, and disability, two things that need to be talked about a lot more. And uh, disability, specifically, I'll be talking about a little bit more than uh, you know race. Not that um, I do a lot in both of them, uh, you know, um, in the community as well as academically and scholarly. So um, that's kind of the question. So, um, why focus on people with disabilities and people of color? The largest oppressed group in the world is people with disabilities. It's a kind of the invisible hand. Anybody at any given time in history can be identified as a person with disability. If you're really young, if you're a baby, you have disabilities. If you're very old, you have disabilities. In some part of your life, you will be in that community, right? Largest racial group in the world, people of color. So, we're looking at you know that small groups. Um, so, I'm going to like skip that. On depending on. So I created this um, kind of like framework because people kind of get confused on like using these words uh, within the field of disability studies. And I wanted to kind of kind of break down. And for some of you, it's kind of the first time to speak about disability issues. So normalcy is the theory of all of this stuff. So how do you implement it? Well, we need you know these um, you know these elements in the world to make sure you know what is right and what is wrong. And those are called norms, right? And then to be in the state of, like, in good uh, relationships and in good standing with these norms, you'll be normal. And to move from abnormal to normal is the normalization of, you know, the world. And I'll be talking about uh, also about, like, anti-civ issues and um, a variety of other things. So. The very beginning of your life, you are told um, to the doctor, do you have a healthy baby? Uh, and healthy also means not having any disabilities. And if you do have a, dis like, a child with disabilities, 
you either have an abortion or take on three different things. One, the child is going to have a lot of trouble um, and struggle. Society is going to struggle with that child, or we are going to struggle with that child, right? But one of those three, if not all three, we see as a struggle, rather than seeing us as all being having disabilities, right? Um, and I, you know, kind of note now, you'll see as I, I note, we should be looking at disabilities as noting of, of differences rather than um, lacking of, right? Kind of the same term as minority, which minority means lack of as well. So, which disability, again. First people um, that were wiped off the planet by the Nazis, um, as many possibly people know, are the people with disabilities, right? And they also tested on people with disabilities. And so we have to really understand, like, the purification, and if you look at Radical Earth Liberation Front and radical extremist groups, um, Charles Manson and other organizations really kind of line themselves very finely with this purification of nature, um, which was kind of also the elimination of people with disabilities. And um, so we can see this line where Charles, uh, not Charles Hurwitz, but, um, uh, um, who is a Redwood person, but um, Charles Manson, if I didn't say that correctly. And so we can see this through, you know, the criminal justice, the punitive criminal justice system, where, or in society as well, they imprison people with disabilities. Um, Africa, who was shot um, in his back on the ground in Los Angeles maybe a month and a half ago, um, he was in, in a, a mental hospital for 10 years, let out for six months, and then shot in the back. Um, and again, we're not addressing people with disabilities in the correct way, right? And in the 1960s, we released tons of people from mental hospitals and wards because they were doing lobotomies and, 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 and electrotherapy, quote, therapy, and you know, then they went homeless and then they were incarcerated. So we can see these you know, things that are going on. And if anybody doesn't know about eugenics, we can see that there's an extremely horrible racist um, science that said that women have smaller brains, queer people have smaller brains, African Americans have smaller brains, and it was all like related to these ideas of you know you don't want to have disabilities, right? So and if women didn't know how to iron or fold their clothes, they had hysteria, and we can kind of look at these things, and they went into you know rehabilitation for their hysteria, which is also hysterical. You know, another term. So what is eco-ability? Some people don't know it. Kind of in the same fashion of eco-feminism, we need to start speaking and addressing the, uh, the, the concerns within our ecological world as well as in our, um, in our animal liberation world, um, looking at the connection between the three, right? So the three are really simple. It's animal liberation, disability liberation, and earth liberation. And um, in 2012, we put out a book, and before that, we really like, started doing a lot of presentations on it. Um, a, a small collective of us, and it's called Eco Ability Collective, as you kind of noted um, or, or saw. And these are kind of the fields that um, kind of connected. So if you looked at studies and field. And so here's like what eco uh, ability values are, right? Um, it's engaging, um, it's in solidarity, it's intersectional, it's for total liberation. Techno digital justice. So if you're going to have a phone, make sure it's you know in a liberatory and accessible and inclusive way, but rather than just kind of using it for games and you know PlayStation because PlayStation was you know clear cutting um, you know forest and lot of land, uh, you know uh, mining lands and then you know destroying gorilla habitat as well as putting ch children um, into you know work camps. So we have to understand, like, if we're going to use this technology, and this is kind of where the green anarchists, you know, always have a battle with um, the eco ability people. What do we do in this situation, right? Um, but this is wearing glasses, having wheelchairs, and the small like elements of assisting people and living is not the major problem with massive technology destruction, right? So we have to really understand this, right? Um, so working to end ableism. So it's not like. I remember the first time I worked on disability studies, which I didn't want to work on because I'm a person with disabilities, and from first to 12th grade I was in segregated schools from special ed and learned how to read um, in 12th grade or 11th grade. And so, you know, I didn't know, you know, that was, I want to focus on animal liberation, I'll focus on uh, earth liberation, I'll focus on queer liberation, I'll focus on political prisoners. I don't want to focus on disability because that's me. 
and that's kind of the, the issue around a lot of oppression struggles. Um, so then I had to figure out how to spell ableism, and I think a lot of people spell it wrong in the very first phase <laughs> of uh, that. And I was like, and I learned how to spell college in college. Um, I was spelling collage the whole time, <laughs> which like I was like, this is a collage, <laughs> um, but I thought it wasn't. So, um, so speciesism and ecocide are two of the other things that we really want to focus on, right? So here's these binaries, like, okay, cool, high theory stuff, yes. So socially constructed binaries, humans, animals, as we know, normal versus abnormal, domestic versus wild, wild being the savage, right? Wild being the unintelligent, the domestic being the intelligent, the civilized. So this is kind of where, again, we as green anarchists come together, like, oh, I like this, not the technology. Um, so it's like they go back and forth. So, um, so uh, working to end ableist language. So I'm going to talk a little bit about language here. And I'm going to give some case studies of some people. And um, just because of um, how significant those two individuals were within the disability liberation movement. Um, so not the use of idiot, freak, psycho. Not all people that are psychopaths are violent and they're not in horror flicks. Um, even though like a really good heart like needs a psycho. Um, so crazy, moron, lame. So if you don't want to go out on a Friday night, you're not lame. Uh, moral schizophrenia, which comes from Gary Francione, so we kind of challenged him. Um, he does great work when it comes to the property issues. Sick, ill, crippled, disabled, the R word, dyslexic, psychopath, and there's so many more. Anybody like to add any that I missed? There's a lot more. Um, so we have to really understand, these are not just like slang terms. These are actually terms that were in science um, and the, the, you know, the medical industry to stigmatize individuals. Just, and we have to see this in the queer liberation movement as well, that if somebody wants a body transfer, a transformation, they have to have a disability, a gender disability, right? So you know, this is still going on to this day, right? Gay is not having a disability. Like we took that out of the books. But being trans, you have to have a disability to have body modification. Right? So these are the two major things when we talk around the disability rights community. Like, hey, animal testing needs to stop, but it helps us. And anybody know who that monkey is? Riches. Riches. Yeah, Riches. Awesome. <laughs> cool. And Riches, if anybody doesn't know, and I, um, was at a university learning a whole bunch um, with this tube and a sound, which was just screeks and breaking and glass and metal and all these things. And like, what was the effect of that? Of course we know the effect of that, right? Um, okay, and then service animals. Um, what are some like problematics around service animals? Anybody? Any thoughts about service animals? Like, why would it be a bad idea? Why would you not want to be a service animal? Any thoughts? Yes? Uh, well, uh, I, I have a little bit of a background in this. I remember uh, hearing from uh, a disabled uh, professor at U of P that uh, his uh, service dog was presented to him as being like another tool for uh, to accommodate his needs, and like the animal was kind of presented as being like almost like a machine, and like when uh, when the animal doesn't work anymore, you can replace it with another one. Yeah. So it's it's part of the instrumental. Yeah. And we have to understand service animals are police. Service animals are in the military. Service animals are also in the medical industrial complex as well. So service animals are there to provide a, a service, right? Exploitive, non-paid service, 24-7, mm -hmm. right? When the person has to urinate, the person has to get up, the person has to find a bomb, the person, you know, is going on the military bases, et cetera. You, these animals are, are work day in and day out, right? Um, without any voluntary, you know, questioning, right? So. Really good book, really good scholars, but we need to kind of understand our, our work of the freak, right? So, and then um, more importantly, uh, like I know a lot of people that like, you know, um, got stickers of vegan freak and all these things and put it on their cars and all these things. So it's, again, accountability of learning. We all are accountable of like learning in the sexist, racist, homophobic, ableist world. So we all are like trying to figure out this stuff together, right? So my professor at Syracuse University, Bob Bogdan, kind of broke it down into two sections of what a freak was, historically speaking. He said that there were Native American, First Nation, or indigenous groups of people, or, as we all know, because of, we're talking about disability issues, people that were, quote, not normal physically looking, right? And we can see that through the freak show, right? 
So Peter Singer, founder of the modern animal liberation movement, through like I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna ask for like physical hands, which is ableist, and these chairs are completely ableist. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna ask like through hands, did anybody know that Peter Singer was okay, cool. So and then Peter Singer, a lot of people, I just wrote it like like I wrote this statement like Peter Singer is an ableist. Um, I love his work, you know, he's very important, but ba da da da. Um, and I think that, and it was on Facebook, he's like, no, he didn't say that. So here's his quote. Um, I'm not like editing it. I wish I was because I went to school in like severe people with disabilities. And, uh, but this is what he said and I'm hoping he like takes it back and like fights for the disability community. Um, but, and he has a bunch of other quotes, but this one's, you know, um, a really fine one. To have a child with Down syndrome is to have a, a very different experience from having a normal child. It can still be a warm and loving experience, thank gosh, um, but we have lower expectations, also called the deficit model, of our children's ability. We cannot expect a child with Down syndrome to play the guitar, to develop an appreciation of science fiction, to learn a foreign language, to chat with us about the latest Woody Allen movie, which like, I guess, like, or to be the respectful athlete, basketball player, tennis player. And then this kind of comes from my story. Um, and so looking at from my story, we had 13 people in our graduating class at Briarwood High School. It's a private school, so we looked at class issues. Like if you look at my story, and there was predominantly white kids. When I went to a special ed school in Philadelphia, it was predominantly kids of color. And then I went to down to Houston, Texas, and went to Briar, and I was like, whoa, different kind of experience, different kids, didn't understand about race, and you know, I became more and more conscious of these things. And uh, I was on the basketball team. I was all city, um, out of four million you know, people population. Of course, not everyone played high school basketball. Um, I loved to run, so they took me off and like seven other kids off of our medication for a week. And uh, we won three um, uh, state championships in Texas, not like Rhode Island, like Texas. Um, and uh, no offense to Rhode Island, I love it. Um, just uh, but, um, you know, but if any, does anybody running here? Anybody know anything about running? Or we're a bunch of academics running. Right? <laughs> Body, we don't have anybody, which is fine. Um, so that idea, um, seven of us were off our medication and we competed with 5A schools, the largest schools, and we beat them. The fastest person um, was Mike Sanderson, a dear friend, um, who's still alive, um, but a lot of our friends died um, from uh, disability people, um, uh, issues. So um, Mike Sanderson got a 14.52 in three miles, which is pretty fast. And I was one of the slowest people, and I got a 17, like 30. Um, so we were really fast. So we had abilities, uh, and we could do what Peter Singer said we couldn't do. And we had, you know, people in our class that had Down syndrome and that were called the extreme work. So we have to really understand that just because you don't understand Down syndrome people and how, you know, the most brilliant person, arguably on this planet, teaches at Oxford, can't speak that well, can't move that well talks about aliens and why God doesn't exist, like beyond like animal issues, like he's already on aliens, um, is Stephen Hawking, right? So we have to really understand that these individuals, and of course, like what do we do with super powered like people? We create them and like make cartoons of them and call them X-Men, right? And the leader of the X-Men is a physically disabled person. So people say, oh, this is sexist. Well, it's also ableist, right? And so I want to get you to look through these things from an ableist perspective. Stop being a moron and start getting skinny, right? So not only is it like sexist, but it's also moron, you know, an ableist framework. So again, veganism has nothing to do with animals. I don't know why we think it is. It has everything to do with being sexy and healthy, right? So this is like a famous button that we need to really start challenging, you know, with, with ourselves, within ourselves. Um, and that's not enough, we've got cookbooks to look sexy. Um, so we got buttons, we've got shirts, and we've got, you know, Pamela Anderson, who's like completely fake, right? So this is completely ableist as well. And then I just found out from Sean Parson, who's a wonderful person, he said that Pamela Anderson met with the governor um, in Arizona to say that um, the prison should have a uh, meatless-based diet. So don't close prisons down. Just get them to become vegan. Um, so like, I got another article. Um, again, 
our wonderful Groupita, who does some good work, you know, but this, this is not one of theirs. And not one of their high points, okay? Of course, like autism, which a lot of my friends, and I'm in that community, um, you know, what is so wrong about autism? Um, but I guess if you drink milk, you'll get autism, which is completely false, um, if you didn't know that, right? Um, again, John Luganacci and myself created these quotes and like these memes because we were like on a nice little meme day. Um, so he said, civilization and normalcy um, cultivates labels in order for weeds to be yanked out. So we have to really understand normalcy and civilization. Normalcy is the theory while civilization is the actual product that the normalization constructs, right? So disrupting normalcy is not eco-terrorism. It is dissent against the violence of civilization. So um, here's some language, and then we're going like, to move into racism. What do I have, like four minutes? OK, cool. All right, so not equality, because it's a measurement, but equity. Um, don't say lame, say boring. Don't call George W. Bush crazy. Call him not constructive, <laughs> if you can do that. Um, don't call your professor a moron. Just don't say, just say you're not correct, right? So this is the words and language that we have to kind of work on, right? So now we're into to racism. And, and uh, so I wrote about this. And uh, Mike Vick, of course, did something bad. But isn't it interesting that all of the animal entertainment that is legal is predominantly based in a white culture or predominantly owned and by CEOs of whites while cockfighting is Chicano, Latino um, in this culture and it's illegal and dogfighting, which is predominantly in the African American culture, is illegal as well. Which I can guarantee if you talk to a dog and you talk to like a whale type, let's say, and I'm sure they would argue on who's more oppressed, right? It's not about legalization, but when we look at the legal system and the criminal justice system, we again perpetuate this idea of race because the criminal justice system in the US was grounded on racism, right? So looking at jailing abuse versus punitive justice, and we need to get out of this whole idea of jailing um, people that abuse animals uh, because we can't use it um, if we're prison abolitionists. Why should we be prison abolitionists? Because prisons came from a racist institutional history, right? Um, so here's Mike Vick, you know, demonizing him. Uh, there was a whole world, you know, stigmatizing and demonizing him. And we have more discussion and, and we can talk about this, right? Um, again, a few years ago, we created this campaign against um, or for to educate and uh, take accountability for those animal rights activist groups that are providing a vegan Thanksgiving. We want to say, like, Still, Thanksgiving is not um, an ethical choice. It's still a genocide, even though you might celebrate, right? Everybody's eating bananas. We need to understand, even if you're vegan, eating bananas might not be the best thing in Costa Rica or South and Central America, right? Again, Cliff Bar, chocolate. Most of the chocolate that you consume is not ethical. And here's the, the effects of it. That's like the stuff that you don't want to see, right? You just want to see the label. Um, again, we don't have any prisoners in the United States. We have 2.5 million slaves in the United States because of the 13th Amendment. Neither slaves nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime in the United, in the United States right, or in the States, right? So savior mentality, kind of not a good idea. So we need to kind of challenge this in looking at why we do things, why we hold animals. We love taking pictures of animals and putting them on Facebook, but what is it perpetuating, right? Um, and this is just a, a, like a slide to get us thinking about different perspectives, right? So um, I think that, yeah, so um, I'll kind of wrap up with kind of looking at total liberation from an intersectional perspective. Intersectionality Katie came out of Crenshaw, Kim Crenshaw, 1989. I think it's a really exciting idea. Um, it's the foundation of critical animal studies, kind of looking at things from a variety of different perspectives. And I don't think I would have valued intersectionality if I didn't have myself from a, like an LGBTQ perspective or, or a person with disabilities. And I think that's really important that, you know, if you, you can't understand and you can't um, sympathize, um, which is fine, um, the least, um, if you can do anything, begin to listen um, about other people's stories. So again, total liberation is really important on the direction, but intersectionality is as important. So thank you so much for your time. We have time for questions for all three speakers. Can we sit up here?
Now you don't want to talk. <laughs> right? Start, Laura. Um, I was thinking during your talk about you use the term feral and you also mm -hmm. use the term rewilding quite often. And I was just kind of tossing around those terms in my head and thinking about how they're related. Um, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on the relationship between you know what being feral means in a rewilded world or, or restored world. Yeah, so. Uh, so I said Farrell is like the title of George Mondio's uh, book, and he gives it um, the definition on the title page that says, uh, in a wild state, especially after escape from captivity or domestication. Um, so, um, I don't know, I've been living, I've been living in Nevada, and in Nevada I think of Farrell, like I think of the horses that are there, like maybe there were horses there a long time ago. It's not those horses that are there currently. Um, but uh, I think uh, thinking about Barrel is so interesting in a colonized country um, because we really, I, mean, I have no place here except that I was born here. Um, historically, I would have no place here. but. Um, movements toward indigeneity, like indigeneity is um, a comprehensive term, um, looking at not only where are you from, like historically, like what is your ethnicity, but how do you spend your life, like what is your livelihood like, and using that to be more encompassing of having a place. Uh, yeah, I think that's like, I think wild doesn't have that complexity. Oh, I, I had a uh, comment for Olivia. Yeah. And it, it seems to me that uh, the, the quote unquote happy meat movement, the, the green animal products movement, it, it seems to me to be a, to be something that has been manufactured by the neoliberal order to to provide an option for people who are discontented but with capitalism while still making them contribute to that system as well, because I, uh, a friend of mine told me about uh, the Global Conference on Sustainable Feed, even though this is supposed to be an alternative market to be uh, that uh, people who feel, or feel discontented with the system participate in. At the same time, it was uh, sponsored by uh, these huge uh, factory farming corporations and fast food corporations like McDonald's and Cargill. And and it seems to me that like this is a way that resistance is kind of this is flattened because it seems that people are are just are clearly discontented with neoliberalism. But if they if you can buy a certain product, and I, I think this this also goes to some to some extent like to to vegans who who don't make the move to becoming activists who who just think that uh, buying a vegan product is activism. That like consume could, that purchasing a certain product that will deal with your discontentment with capitalism for you, and you don't you don't need to resist it in other ways. You can just you can just buy something. Yeah. Um, what did I say? I totally agree with you. Yeah. It was a comment, right? I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I guess the the one problem that I have is that the whole like sustainable meat idea. Coming back to your like, first point. Um, or yeah, like this harmony, living in harmony with nature is also a point that some like anarcho primitivist friends of mine say, right? Like, oh yeah, like yeah, we live in these rural communities and we are in harmony like, with these animals that we kill. It's a natural way to live, etc. It's so sustainable, it's so ecological, etc. And yeah, I mean they don't get the numbers right, and they're just yeah, I think they don't really reflect on their oppression of other beings. I think that yeah, I agree with you. I'm wondering, um, so Anne, you had like the slides with um, bananas and chocolate on your presentation, which obviously is very important. But I'm wondering like how 
how y'all navigate um, kind of choosing like more responsible um, products while not falling into the mindset of like, you know, consumerism and like voting with your dollar. Did you say that again? Yeah, yeah. So, so like when thinking about what to purchase, I'm thinking like, okay, I'm gonna buy, um, I'm not gonna buy bananas, I'm not gonna buy chocolate because um, they are, you know, they're produced on the backs of slavery, for example. Um, but how do you make that decision without kind of thinking like, okay, by making that choice, I am exercising like power as a consumer and falling into like a capitalist mindset? Well, I think we're going to, like we are consumers, like, right? So I think we should like get used to that. But I think that um, presentations kind of like before talked about this green capitalism or this like animal, you know, cruelty free capitalism, which is highly problematic, right? Um, because capitalism is not going to solve the world's problems, um, as we, you know, I hopefully most people in this room acknowledge. Um, but I, I also, you know, so get over the understanding of like how we're hypocrites in a, in a system that we are participating in. Um, but if you do participate in it, at least be as acknowledged, like aware of like what you can do and what you shouldn't do. And I think like there, if, if there wasn't an alternative to bananas and like that's the only food that we could eat, then that's like, you know, but I think if we're looking at like the scale of, of highly exploitive consumption on an individual basis, um, you know, uh, Coffee's up there, bananas are up there, chocolate's up there, things that we don't need. So it's kind of that, you know, and I talk to my students about it, it's like, whoa, I didn't even know. So it's kind of like, yeah, um, it's kind of moving in the right direction and kind of being that intersectional, kind of looking at the race class and, and things of that sort. But again, like doing it from a political perspective of saying like, okay, let's critique capitalism and the economic system while, you know, we were talking like, Let's also speak about alternatives, direct democracy, mutual aid, you know, Marxism, communism, like there's alternatives out there. But it seems like to be an animal rights activist, you don't need to know political like analysis. Like, it's so cool, you know, you just go vegan. Yeah. Um, you know, like um, the world like and I think that was what Kim Socha was kind of speaking, and a lot of people in this room speak about us too. I, you know, um, is about that like shortcoming of the animal rights activists of not being political whatsoever. Uh, question for you, Olivia. Uh, can you speak, say something about the zero growth movement and how that's taking shape in Europe vis-a-vis -vis these questions and what, what your experience has been in terms of, like it's very frustrating to see the same discussion of or discourse of happy meat and so forth dominating North America, but I'm not as familiar with the European case. I'm wondering how animal activists or like what's going on to disrupt that discourse of you know sustainable meat and so forth. So your first question was on the degrowth movement? I'm sorry, degrowth. Degrowth, yeah, no problem. Um, which originated kind of in France and which is uh, much stronger in um, Mediterranean, Mediterranean country, countries than northern countries, so it's kind of strong in Spain or Italy and France, where in general we have the stereotype that people already lead, lead a kind of a chill life where they don't work so much and they hang out in the sun. Um, so the Liga movement, um, yeah, I was um, like a co founder, was part of a group in my hometown. And you were asking like how it was state or towards kind of immigration issues, I imagine. Um, yeah, so so it's kind of a mixed. We have like a mixed picture. We have some um, people that acknowledge, yeah, of course, like a, if you want to be a true environmentalist, for example, because degrowth is an environmental movement, um, you have to be, for example, vegan. But I guess like the radical animal liberationist perspective is not that well. Um, um, represented, um, yeah. But I mean, I have to say, like, I'm I, I'm also critical of the deep growth movement as such because they are sometimes also lack of a deeper, like, systemic critique. There is a small uh, anarchist deep growth movement with, with which I would rather, yeah, strongly agree. Um, yeah. So it's kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have more radical people. You have more mainstream people. And also some people that just focus on sustainable consumption with, with as a degrowth. And the question on the, on the sustainable meat in Europe, 
Um, as, so as I'm from Switzerland, like people often say that we have, like, we have, we're not part of the European Union because we are very like, xenophobe and country that we think we can make it on our own. Um, so, and Switzerland has like a, a, a stronger, more strict um, than that. And so perhaps we have the problem that people already say like our animal industry is kind of more or less humane because it's Switzerland and everybody, like all animals can live outside, right? This is like a stereotype that people have. Um, but, but I mean, the sustainable meat is still, is still prevalent. Perhaps there's not such a huge distinct how should I say split or like here in the US where people say, say oh it's all factory farm but we have uh, the we have the solution uh, you may need um, but we still have it so we have or we, we talk about organic meat it's organic meat so everybody yeah wants to buy organic meat it's not really no, nobody talks really about sustainable or humane meat but organic meat. Uh, <coughs> thanks for all of you for your paper. My question is for Anthony and Max, because I'm not from the US, I'm from Canada, and I w uh, your slide on uh, <coughs> the number of prisoners uh, went a bit too fast for me, and I did not get what you meant on this slide. Could you enlighten me then? Sure. Um, so um, <coughs> I'd say begin with something and then end with what your answer mm -hmm. is uh, for the question. Uh, so. Uh, we have to understand that um, the animal rights movement, uh, ha as an answer, uses the current system, capitalism, um, in consumption. Everyone just eats, goes to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, you know, buys mopped up, et cetera, um, and that's the answer. And then in the criminal justice system, um, if that was the economic system, the criminal justice system. Um, our answer to crimes are to incarcerate individuals, right? And what I'm trying to argue within the animal rights movement is no matter what they've done, like Vic to like the worst thing, that we cannot use prisons, the death penalty, or any punitive process to answer um, the calls of social justice. And, and, and it has to be transformative justice or restorative justice or you know healing, accountability, voluntary, um, you know, and so that would be part one. So part two, like the slide, is currently in the United States in state prisons, not youth detention centers and, and federal prisons, but we have about 2.5 million people, probably a lot more than that, right? Um, and they're trying to depopulate, depopulate prisons um, or privatize prisons because they have so many people, right? And there's like this mass critique of prisons. So now they're doing home arrests, they're doing parade, uh, probation, they're doing satellite like surveillance of individuals that are on probation. So they're doing a variety of things um, that, again, are not educational whatsoever, right? So you did 20 years in jail, so are you going to be a sex offender still? Are you going to be um, you know, caught on drugs still? Are you going to be um, involved in hate crime? Yes. Like, Prisons don't educate people. So that's what I was kind of noting as the, as, as the point. And then the 13th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, which is like our foundational laws, um, actually says right after the Civil War, they institutionalized slavery for anybody that committed a crime. And oddly enough, after the Civil War, a lot of black people committed a lot of crimes. Um, and then they filled the prisons with black people. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I, I had a question for Anthony. I was wondering about um, the the, sort of the reply, the, the non-paradigm human reply, AKA the marginal case. So, so I, I teach a philosophy, an animal rights class. And so I'm in a classroom and people say, well, the reason why humans are superior to pigs is because they have X, Y, and Z cognitive abilities. So now, okay, I'm, now, I'm, it's very effective pedagogically to say, well, what about human beings who have particular deficits such that cognitively they're at the same level as the pig? Or as, lower. Right, or lower. So you have this counterexample, which is a very stark counterexample. And yet, I've had discussions with my, my colleagues and, and friends um, uh, who, who said, who, who discourage me from using that example in that it's, it carries ableist connotations and that it's, it's sort of comparing 
these humans to animals, and so it's kind of it's kind of a messy area. And I was wondering if you could give me your thoughts on that. On that. Yeah, I agree with friends. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything else to like add. Somebody else might like add something, but um, yeah, I don't think I think the animal rights movement and the animal liberation and critical animal studies have moved such like beyond belief. Like uh, you know, um, Vassar um, students there like are blowing my mind. Like there's so many students doing tremendous amount of work, and I don't think the cognitive argument should be used um, at all like because of the ableist like, articulation that your friends have noted. Um, I think we can argue it on a variety of other levels now. So, so um, can but you, I think it was noted for a long time, yeah. but I think we can move on. So can you help me then? I'm my student in my classroom, and I say to you, well, look, the reason why the, the pig and the human, because the human is, has cognitive abilities that the pig doesn't have. Can you, can you model pedagogy for me that's not ableist right now so I can take it back? And that would be effective for an undergraduate rancher? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I will, I'll do it afterwards. Okay. Um, that's like, that's fair. Fair enough. Fair so, enough. But I would totally be down to go ahead. Thanks. Oh, uh, I, I just had some ideas with regard to that. Like, I, I don't know if there, if there's time for that or I, I just I just wanted to say that uh, that, that recently uh, Will Kimlick was a speaker at for a group that I organized in Toronto, and he was he was taking up uh, the argument from marginal cases, which is the name of that argument, which is which is really ableist. I think that's hard to deny. And he was saying like you know that even just the name that's a really disgusting term, and but. Personally, like reflecting on that, like I, I wonder if there would be a, a, a way to, to bring that up in a way that is an ableist. Because I, I wonder if, like, per, perhaps instead of saying, well, well, look at all the intellectual deficits that people with certain disabilities have, because like that's just focusing, that's just uh, focusing on disability as, as a negative, and and also like it's using that deficit model, like that disabled people are lacking in some way. But I wonder if. Uh, you could bring up like the history of uh, disabled people being targeted for supposedly being less intelligent, and bringing up that there are many different kinds of intelligence. Uh, yeah, recently, like people who study animal behavior have been showing us that like they're, that we privilege our own type of intelligence when intelligence isn't strictly like the way we would think about it. And uh, like so, I think maybe we could bring up like the violence that has been done to disabled people. It. Be, uh, because of this assumption that a certain type of intelligence defines whether you're morally considerable or not, like I wonder if that would be a way of bringing that up. That doesn't, that isn't like in an ableist way that that uh, frames disability as being inherently lacking. Just my thoughts. Kind of looking at the achievement model when it comes to race issues, saying like, oh, black kids are not achieving as much as white kids. Well, maybe they don't want to think the way like a free capitalist does. Exactly. Like, wow, what a concept. And yeah. because they don't, they're lacking or they're a gap or an opportunity gap. And I think like feminism argues for emotion, right? Rationality. So you look at like that cognitive, like different thoughts. Mm -hmm. you, you want to I just to wanted to add a little thing on this, just because I. <clears throat> I uh, prepared a talk that I have to give to a lot of uh, feminist, uh, non-vegan uh, feminist audience. And I tackled with the problem of the marginal cases argument. And I, one of my friends is a, a vegan disabled, disabled uh, disability scholars. And he suggested, in fact, that we should use this argument to insist that the, if we present it not as a question of coherence, this is where the problem is. This is because you can just say, okay, let's be coherent and on like human yeah. babies or something. But if we present it as an occasion to insist that the reason why uh, some individual, uh, that, uh, that every vulnerable self deserve basic and equal moral consideration regardless of physical or cognitive ability or disabilities, uh, it's actually a way that the animal liberation mo movement can actually really help the, uh, the disability movement. That's, that was his take on this. So he actually used it, but not as a coherence question, mm -hmm. as it is often used, but in or, as a way to show that, to argue that every vulnerable self deserves basic and equal consideration, to push this point. 
So I think that if we can use it in this way, I'm not sure that I would see a problem with it. But of course, we need to change the, the title. <laughs> That's what I call it, the, the argument. I call it the non-paradigm problem. Yeah, yeah, maybe we should just argue it, present it as a every vulnerable self sure. matter or something. <laughs> I have a question for Laura. Um, yeah, I, I think you thought was really interesting. And I have been thinking about the notion of population. And so my roommate, she's a, in, with birth first, and she always says, like, yeah, you know, we are too many people in this bed. And this makes me, like, makes me feel very uncomfortable. And yeah, I, would, I was just uh, wondering you know, what, you, what you think, because once you said uh, we have a population explosion, or yeah, do you think you or the rewilding um, theory or yeah, the anarchists uh, think of on the population issue? Yeah, um, so I guess I would like population is an issue. But I think that um, the way that uh, our subsistence is removed from us, like we do not see everything that goes into how our lives are sustained. I think that whole process um, encourages overpopulation, um, and also and also the ways in which um, Western civilization has colonized other parts of the world to bring them into the system. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that decolonization would be probably the like the first step in trying to do that, but also, um, I mean, it's really hard, right, to get rid of people who are here and have needs. I mean, I don't agree with that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Just, I would never yeah. do it. Yeah. No, and I'm saying no one wants to do it. Well, but, <laughs> but at some point, something will do it for us, right? Because every other, every other population we see in the natural world has some sort of um, uh, there is always a me there. Are, I mean, there are many different ways for a mechanism to be tripped to bring that population back into balance. And I think that what we are doing now is very dangerous, simply in existing in these large numbers. I mean, we already see we already see the wars that are breaking up because we are so territorial. I mean, this has been going on for thousands of years, but. I think, I mean, it's just the undesirable question, right? Like, what will happen to the population that's not sustainable? Something bad will happen. Um, and so, I think looking at, I don't know, I feel like what I'm addressing here is sort of like the impossibility of sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, the issue that if you want to address the population, that is bad. If you don't want to address it, that is also bad. Mm -hmm. Like essentially, there's no good way. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, ethically, ethically and emotionally, there's no good way out of this. Yeah. May I just respond to that? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a very problematic issue, and I think. Yeah, some that green some green anarchists approach it in a very horrible, I can mean horrible way. Because when you talk about population control, I mean what does population control mean? I mean one, who controls it? Do we have like a central authority that mm -hmm. says like, okay, you're allowed to reproduce, you're not allowed to reproduce. It's always about control of women's fertility also. Mm -hmm. Like it's like in throughout our history it has not really been like control of male fertility, it's always uh, women fertility. So many, it's such a huge story of genocide, of mass sterilization, of mm -hmm. disabled people, of people that were not welcomed or didn't use, uh, didn't serve a special role, etc. So we have a huge history of repression when it comes to population control. Um, and I mean, as far as the numbers, I mean, when you look at the state of the world today, it's not. I would just don't say it's not about the numbers. I mean, of course, there is no infinite growth in a world of finite resources, yes. But we just have to, we have to find a social and a political solution to that, and we have to change 
how we produce and how we consume. And I think it's not so much how about how many we are, but how like big our footprint is or for whom we to produce. I mean, half of the goods that are produced are just thrown away. I mean, and all these yeah. artificial means that are created through capitalism, so we should really, I think just we should rather talk about the yeah, systemic questions of capitalism and not go along this road at all of population control. I think it's a very, I, I don't know. Yeah. See, I, I would never advocate for any sort of like remotely mandated population control. I think that's just yeah. too dangerous, and that has been dangerous and violent. Um, but I, I mean, looking looking at different uh, like indigenous cultures, usually there is some sort of mechanism in place to manage the population um, if it's an issue in their area, um, and those are not always happy mechanisms. Um, once they are widely um, so uh, I would say um, some cultures institute. Uh, castration of a certain number of males that are born into their culture. Um, I think the Moriori did that. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, th and they were, they needed to live in limited numbers on their island. Um, and so they did that to a certain number of the men. But I think there are other ways of doing that. But I, I think that we're just so far removed from uh, cultural responsibility and communal responsibility that we don't consider those things at all. Like we don't consider, I'm not saying like culturally it's not uh, encouraged to consider the weight of the population in terms of responsibility. I, I have a related question about that, Laura. In the literature that you read about rewilding, was population brought up? Um, was that a part of the <coughs> the writers whom you read, like I don't know, Mondio and I, I forgot which ones, but you, you cited a few writers. But in your study of them, did they address population? You know, I don't. Was that? part of their argument or consideration or discussion? Uh, Mambio does say that he advocates maintaining corporate agriculture um, just because it is efficient um, and to maintain it on lands that are still functioning to farm to maintain the population that we have um, because uh, he notes that I think in a uh, I can't remember exactly the detail, but uh, on Great in the UK, Great like Great Britain, like that Isle, um, would maybe be able to uh, support five thousand individuals in a hunter gatherer lifestyle, whereas one town has um, one tiny part of that would have like two hundred sixty. So um, he does look at it saying, um, like, forward wilding is not a possibility. It's just not. Um, so he looks at ways that rewilding can be done incrementally instead of going, like, trying to be a hunter together entirely. Yeah. I think we just have time for one last question. Yeah, this is, this is just a footnote to this discussion. Um, it seems like birth rates go down when there's increased um, uh, opportunities um, uh, and for people to, to in additional economic opportunities and, and uh, economic benefit for development. So, and that would require moving away from capitalism, which is an assumption that I think all animal rights people and all social justice movements of any of, you know, of all sorts, you know, should come together collectively, you know, to agree on that, work on that together. So, keeping keeping that in mind, I think the scenario that we're moving toward right now, you know, especially based upon your presentation, is this increased unsustainable system with climate change coming in and the population continuing to grow, 
and that countries like the United States, organizations like the CIA and NSA and Pentagon, they're seeing this future and they're preparing for this militarily. So I think, tragically, if we continue on this trajectory, I mean, that this is the way that the human population probably is going to be dealt with in a very militaristic and violent way to the struggle over remaining resources. The animal liberation movement, we need to come together collectively, realize how vital it is to have this shared critique of the capitalist system and to begin developing models and, and discussions on how we can transcend it. Sorry, wasn't it Jameson, Frederick Jameson, who said it's easier to envision the end of the world than it is to envision the end of capitalism? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.